Well, very good. Well, thank you, Fionn, for, uh, for all those words. Um, this is, uh, we'll say, going to be a fast and dirty uh, Q&A session, uh, after which we'll... <laughs> yes. After which we'll uh, we'll break for lunch, and so conversations can continue then. And of course, we look forward to a very um, active and uh, lively afternoon session. Um, so I'll sort of kick off with uh, with two questions, and then we'll try to get some questions from uh, from you, the audience, as well. Um, so I wonder if uh, if you would agree with the idea and sort of why, yes or no, um, if the world has simply become too complex for a single image. Um, and so we see video um, creating these sort of composites and arrays um, that move through time. Hmm. Well, uh, I'm, that makes me think of a phrase. A, a clever person said that the, I think we're inclined th that truth resides in images, but we, there isn't an image of truth. So um, that's probably been true for a really long time. So I don't know if that's changed. Very good. And then um, I wonder, you know, after all, we sort of live in a very cross-disciplinary world. I wonder if, um, if you would sort of, again, agree or disagree and why with the idea that uh, video might be uh, uh, sort of like the photographic corollary to stream of consciousness in writing, in literature. Um, but it just took about, uh, what would you say, 60 or 75 years to catch up. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, in, it's interesting. I mean, the if by subconscious you mean, for instance, in a piece like that, to, to kind of one of the things Saurabh said that sticks with me, which I agree with very much, is the move from the adjectival reality, in a way, of the fo of images from photograph to photographic, um, and that sh there's anxiety in that, and I think we all kind of um, have different re relationships to that shift. But I think if by subconscious you mean has it become more uh, anal capable of analytical response to contemporary experience, then I think for sure, yeah. So, um, and I, in a piece like Jim's, one of the things that I find um, remarkable after watching it a number of times and other pieces of his, including this collaboration he just finished with Leslie Thornton, is that montage was always an acceleration. Montage was, uh, you know, take your pick, choose your reference, was supposed to sort of be the shock of the new. And I think what's really interesting is in this work, maybe perhaps unlike, I don't know, that's a good debate, Camille and Rose piece, there is a certain kind of, um, uh, it's actually very capable of slowing down images. And, there, and I think that has to do with a certain kind of um, erotic, erotic acceptance, in a way, to again respond to your subconscious question. Um, <laughs> Of, of shifts in the way we relate to still and moving images, rather than the documentary turn or rather than discussions of forensics, which are really interesting conversations and we could probably bring to bear on this entire frame. But I think in this regard, that's a very like, it's almost an embodied affective response to these shifts. So um, wherein the photographic resides in a, in a collage aesthetic that is no longer um, probably determined by still images, but more by moving images. Great. And then, uh, so I wonder if there are any questions out there. I'm sort of blinded by the light. We have a microphone handy at the back. Anyone? Yes. Hi. Uh uh, yeah, I, I really like uh, the last video really, really much. Uh, but my question is, uh, I think it, re it responds to one of the uh, earlier uh, statements from, uh, from the first two presenters, or oh, actually to uh, Annie's, uh, like the, uh, the title of her presentation, how can an authentic respond to uh, let's just say, let's just remove the import the, uh, disaster, but how can an authentic respond to contemporary life can be constructed 
and we're using that code in relation to the last video. Um, so I think my question is uh, how I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to figure my head out because a lot of like uh, the footage from that mon from that montage uh, from uh, you know like with like past video something have happened already in the past. So so how can like this like montaging of of moving images of past moving images can be like an authentic response to let's say. Um, or an immediate response to the con to uh, to the con uh, to the contemporary, hmm. and how that like sensation, you know, uh, get um, get 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 constructed in relation to this like stream of us uh, the subconsciousness, because like it's not immediate, it's it's not now, you know. You need to go back to the past and like you know just you need to select your point of reference and then you need to to mo to montage it hmm. in a way. Uh, and one, and um, I think like one of the suggestions that I, that I can think of right now is the act of like repeating, because you can see like several mm -hmm. images happening at the same time. And I think like through the three acts of repeating, you somewhat be able to slow it down. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah, the I pace think that's of the a image. good point. Variation in theme is something. If you talk to biologists, they will tell you that's one of the most important things to learn. Is that variation in theme is embedded in our in the natural world, and that's so. The life of forms is is much more. So I think there is something to that. Um, but I, and I'm not certainly not talking about Jim's work as like a response to. It's just it's just part of this discussion between still and moving, and some of the things that are happening perhaps in the editorial boundaries um, in contemporary practice. Because to respond to your comment. Um, Yalal Tufik, who's a really interesting uh, Lebanese writer, um, he wrote a, a kind of piece about what he calls it. Uh, you, you're gonna have to tell me out. Sort of withdrawal following a surpassing disaster, and um, and then of course Walid Rod's, you know, ac acknowledgedly stole that from him and made a bunch of work out, out of that. Um, and. That concept is a really interesting one because it's, uh, and one that I think is really important because what Tufik talks about is that, for instance, following um, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, certain images and, and certain kinds of uh, evidence or the notion of it being observed withdraws from reality. It, it actually withdraws from the capacity of people to really even talk about and and discuss and live with those images. And you can think of that in terms of many instances of violence and many instances of war and many instances of a kind of uh, surpassing disaster, whether on a large scale or, or a more intimate scale. So I think, and I think that's really important to remember, um, is that these discourses need to be aligned. They aren't all in a way addressing the same thing. So for me, what I think is interesting about this piece is it does have a certain, as you called it, subconscious. I feel like it offers a new analytical and that that new analytical includes things that are really off limits like music <laughs> and um, a sort of different way of seducing the viewer. And I, there's something about it I find really um, buoyant and generative. And why I say that is that the new work that Jim and Leslie made I don't know how to put it. It's like they made it on a whim because they were coming to the Walker to talk about Leslie's new piece. And then they were like, let's make a piece together and let's trade files. And then like six weeks later, they made this like combustible piece that they showed that, the night of the screening. And I don't know how to put it. There's something about that piece, called, it's called Crossing, that really almost brings that to another level because it's two artists with a particular kind of affinity, kind of pushing each other and kind of, I don't know, tangling and unra unraveling in a weird way. And there's something really potent about it. And also, I would say, very political, just of a different kind of politics, the affective politics, the analytical, analytics of imagery. And then I'll, uh, I'll add some comments, sort of piggybacking on that in a completely different direction. Um, I think... Uh, to some extent, it could be argued that art making has to come from a reaction to 
what's happened in one's life. Um, I don't really, I mean, at least I don't believe in creation ex nihilo, creation from nothingness. Um, we live in the world surrounded by other people, natural uh, events, uh, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, as we attribute to those natural events. Um, but when you look at a writer like um, Balzac and L'Oeuvre Inconnu, the unknown masterpiece, where this artist creates something ahead of his time, um, so ahead of his time that notable, other notable artists of his time lack the capacity to understand it, I don't really know how often that has really happened in real life, although there certainly are um, you know, moments in art history where we talk about some uh, development that has really um, pushed everyone uh, around that artist to react in some way. But I, I don't really know that there's a lot of creation that is so ahead of its time uh, or out of, literally out of time, sort of like this timeless um, creation. Um, Another uh, question over here. I can speak very loud. Also. Um, um, do you agree, Fionn, that um, James Richards actually, in his piece Rosebud, that he sheds light on the capacity of still images to capture and save history and time? Um, which is the case with these censored images, right? They mm -hmm. are scratched out, so somehow their surface is hurt. Mm -hmm. But this wound actually shows the reception of the images in this certain cultural context. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel that uh, in his film, wh when he shows the skin and the flowers on the skin, etc., that he, and also with the sound, which is always very important, that he um, sheds light on this um, physical m material of the still image and the capacity to actually save time. Um, I don't think yeah. that, w that it rela this relates to your first question, that, um, that he needs the moving image to capture the complexity of the world. I think he shows that the still image can be recuperated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, I think one of the things that, I mean, art is generally made in less than ideal situations, right? Someone doesn't say, so Rob, make a solo show. <laughs> I mean, you're not, the invitation is not necessarily, um, there's an adaptiveness to artistic practice, which is, I think, crucial to remember, is that there's an, ab it's adaptive. And I think, that in that case, I agree with you that there's a kind of recuperative quality to those images in the adaptive capacity of, of Jim's being, bringing it into the larger frame of that piece, which includes like the flowers and the anus and all of these things kind of brought, there's a, there's, a real, there's a real erotic aesthetics to it that I think has a politics to it as well. But I do think it recuperates those images for sure. Hi. Um, yeah, I saw uh, actually um, Music at Night um, in a program at Projections at the New York Film Festival. Mm. Um, and it was programmed with a couple works by John Raffman, Cecil B. Evans, um, Beatrice Gibson. And they seemed to be kind of deflate in its presence. And I think that those works were attached to kind of a, the, the kind of long shadow of Fro Gross Fatigue. Um, and it was an interesting thing to think about Jim's work in this, in relation to these other works, because there was a kind of um, a, an, a, the artifice of the desktop and the looking at the world that we inhabit every day through the digital world, yeah. the crispness of the desktop, was so present in those other works. Yeah. Whereas Jim seemed to, it seemed to all of his work seems to stretch out and become an abstraction of that while using the same material. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you're thinking, how you're thinking, is it, is it more through the sound base? Is it through more through the kind of a sculptural sense of the material? Um, 
Is it is it an um, an ad attachment to older ideas of editing and and invisible editing that happens through that material yeah. that has been lost when we look at the desktop? I'm just wondering what you think about those. I think those are all really good comments. Yeah, I would agree with all that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just meaning that uh, again, I think there's an era uh, one. I mean, you know, many people have talked about this. Like, what has if there is an atomizing that has happened in our kind of self-absorption of images and information, and um, has it has it in a sense lessened a certain erotic capacity that's at the center of art? I mean, art, and that is, I mean, at least in most cultural, there is something to do with eros. And I think that when you look at the the kind of like. Uh, Bag of bag of aesthetic tricks that Jim maintains. They do they do relate back to someone like Jarman, and you know, and Jarman was Jarman was collaborating with Coil and like was also you know um, working in celluloid and not, and um, also very much capturing a certain sort of civic, urban, uh, queer experience, um, and then but not really calling it that, which is is really I think interesting in terms of that Jim's sort of a bit response to, um, as you say, a kind of editing uh, prompt. I think he has a lot to offer and including very new things like a, a very interesting left to right, you know, which is such a part of our moment, um, the sort of swipe um, cut thing, but in a way that isn't still or moving, but both, um, that is observed and appropriated, that is, uh, incredibly accurate, maybe even scientific, and completely unfaithful and c capable of betraying any one of us. Um, there's a mix in there that I think is really just, and uh, uh, very particular to his work, but also of our moment. Is that? Yeah. So you've talked about... Um, I don't know why I'm talking about Jim so much. Either, well, that's okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> sort of in general, I think I think you made a sort of a more blanket statement about um, the role of eros and the erotic. But you also mentioned um, during your talk um, sort of Kantian notions of of the sublime. Do you see a, an interrelation of those two, um, at least among the the four artists you address today? Well, I think one of the things that Warburg is so, so why he's such an important figure in a way, um, and this idea of the interval as being particularly important to images and and art, you know, art, because um, Panofsky was his mentee, and Erwin Panofsky came to the states and created kind of what we think of as iconology, or or one could say, the sort of art historical modern image as we understand it. The, the provenance of it is well researched its sort of position in terms of economic power, its position in terms of ownership, its position as a representative image, has a kind of like substrata. All things that um, Warburg really believed in, the er erudition, the research, um, the capacity to be polyglot and perhaps even um, polyvalent in the way you look at things. But he also, he brought that into a much more risky proposition, which was that it should be able to respond to the politics of your time. It should be able to respond to, like, this like machine, you know, machinery of war that was like destroying, you know, millions of people. And and I think and also look at some of the tech, uh, technological implications as as being that you could actually have a kind of affective, subjective, positioned, embodied response to. So I, and I bring that up because that was what. That was what Warburg was arguing for. So, um, and in that, I think is implicit as part of that is an eros of one, of of the idea of, of art. That um, that and that eros isn't just sex. I mean, eros is uh, is a politics um, that that carries forward different uh, vantage points um, uh, that can actually speak to erudition and speak to provenance and speak to value and things like that, and probably need to. Great, thank you. I know that there's a question. Uh, yeah, I had a quick question. Um, uh, this past winter, there's a large kind of survey curated 
uh, survey of uh, Andy Warhol's films here, and that was the first time I got to see a lot of them. Uh, and I also, at the same time, was reading Douglas Crimp's book about Warhol's films. And I'm really interested in, in the ethical position he is uh, kind of outlining in that book. And we've been talking about the ethics of the image today, but Crimp kind of frames it this idea of coming together to stay apart. And this idea of this kind of separation or a, a seam is very interesting to me in relation to uh, the kind of contrast between Camille Henri's work and Jim Richards' mm -hmm. work. I mean, in Gross Fatigue, you have this kind of collapse of the screen within the screen within the screen. I think with Jim's work, you have this use of montage, which you kind of highlighted um, or foregrounded early on, that there's this kind of things are coming together, but they're yet retaining their autonomy in some sort of way. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I'm not, but for me, the kind of confusing moment is with the use of sound, where they do kind of collapse and come together, and that's where the affect lies. And I think, I, I was also thinking when I was watching it, thinking a bit about, uh, in relation to affect about Yvonne Rayner's films a bit as well because she has these references to other films and especially commercial films like Jim has in his work but you don't need to know what that source material is to have an affective response yeah. to it which I think is uh, really powerful so just like um, and for me that's where the, the image and the sound comes together in that particular piece anyways but. yeah I, have, I mean and also with gross fatigue it's not our yeah, I guess you'd say go fatigue. No, you wouldn't, would you? Go fatigue. Yeah, go fatigue. Okay. I think. Um, is uh, it's a work that will probably be talked about for a really long time, right? Um, and there's that's and it has there's reasons obviously embedded in it, but there's so it has a sort of proximity to archive and the extended apparatus of museum and sort of a purporting to be scientific or evidentiary that I'm, that is I also partly what makes it good because it's totally, totally unfaithful to any of that perspective. It just kind of takes, but there's something really interesting about that in that piece that um, also I find, uh, I don't know, I don't know how it sits with me over time. So. Um, but uh, yeah, you know. Uh, whereas, like, um, I guess there's something, yeah, there's something different going on in some of the in, in other in some of these other works, Warhol included. Yeah, and then also it's interesting. I read a text by Helen Molesworth recently in October, which she was talking about kind of the museum depot or storage room as this kind of last kind of vestige of privacy in a way that it's this area that you can't see and it's interesting that a lot of artists like i think of rosa barba did a work uh, chris carreri who's here today mm -hmm. toronto artist who's looking like artists who've been looking at that as this kind of area of privacy where work goes and may stay there for 50 years and be un unexhibited or mm -hmm. it's this interesting kind of uh area a uh, blank spot or of uh, privacy yeah the, i mean archive is always like generous i think it, it the Maybe it's one of the differences is when, what does it mean to make a piece that like takes, in a sense, borrows its power from a framing of the piece as a sort of, uh, as, the, as, as the museum apparatus itself in a weird way. Like here's the, the there's something, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, anyway, never mind. But it's just the, like that piece sort of seems of a particular moment. I think that will come across that way over time. Great, and I know there's one last question before we break for lunch. Yeah, um, I was actually going to ask about your ambivalence about the Camille Monroe piece, and if you wanted to maybe speak a bit more about that. I took from your, your description of it that there's maybe a question about slowing down the practice of looking that you feel that maybe the piece fails to do and that you wish it could, that maybe the Richards asks us to do a little more successfully. Um, I sort of interpreted a kind of implicit racial critique also that I've heard made explicit by other critics that there is something about that work that is both completely seductive in its fetishization of black bodies and objects made by people of color that um, is also very troubling as you watch it or rewatch it. So I don't know if that's if something you want to talk more about, but I was curious about that ambivalence and where it might come from. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think that piece fetishizes a lot of things. So including the artist and the narrator and the sense of uh, monologue and unsighted, mon you know, text, um, as well as like, 
a whole range of animal species and I mean it's like it's sort of unabashed about that and I think and pretty polyamorous like it goes all over the place it doesn't have a particular uh, fetishization I just think that the one of the questions that, about my ambivalence about the piece is that there's a sort of um, it's so luxuriating in terms of its kind of getting behind the walls of the, of the you know the apparatus in a sense or into the archive or into the trove that I just think it sort of stays there in a weird way it stays in a kind of uh, maybe more troubling fetishizing which is like it stays in the it's it doesn't break the ethnographic framing into or the to call it the biolog you know the, the the scientist's perspective into a into a dialogical position or I just don't think it happens in that piece which is kind of a, I mean I'm not saying it's just sort of there's something like it almost feels like it needs to do that <laughs> and then it doesn't so there's and there's something that's when I think it's sort of a lot of the response you know a lot it's easy for the viewer to be like god I love, it's so beautiful I just love that piece right I mean it's really easy to be like it's just so cool that piece but and you're like that that's where it starts to maybe have a few questions so, but it's not I don't it's not a critique I think it's a great piece there's no doubt about it so and it's fetishizing I think is pretty wholesale which is I mean just to do, in that perspective I wouldn't that would be a lens I wouldn't necessarily go bring to it but I mean I think it's accurate if that's the lens you're bringing to it well, I'm sure there will be much more discussion of the, uh, we'll say, sensual and sublime uh, as we continue in the afternoon. Uh, thank you so much.